We are uh, now going to move to the speaker roundtable. This is going to be an opportunity for us to really engage in conversation with each other about all the things that have come up. So is that good? We'll start with one question. I'm going to direct this first question to Irvin. And so he has an opportunity to share uh, what he would like. And then we can uh, go on to anyone else who would like to pick this up. Uh, just signal with your hand and we'll pick, pick, put you next. The question that we have first for you is, what have you learned or experienced in this symposium that augments your ability to human well? I'll say it again. What have you learned or experienced in this symposium that augments your ability to human well? Irvin? I have learned that there is a real cause for hope. That this is something that has happened, is happening here, which would have been inconceivable to happen even a year ago or certainly two years ago, that we are literally embodying or are giving expression to the next step in our evolution beyond the crisis, seeing the deep, the deep elements, seeing the deep, the base on which we can construct a better world. I don't know if my ability, my ability is, it gives me confidence that I, if I address these issues, I'm not alone because you are addressing with me all the issues that are absolutely vital today. You know, the subtitle, the title of my, of my next book, which is it's a new edition actually of my book coming out next week, which is called The, the Upshift. Uh, the subtitle is The Path to Healing and Evolution on Planet Earth. What we've been talking here is about heat, healing and evolution on planet Earth. So I couldn't do more than to express my deepest hope, satisfaction, not on a personal level, but in a, in a kind of a, all human level, that there is something in the human spirit which is now be, becoming expressed. And we are expressing it here. We brought it together. <clears throat> I'm not saying much more about the individual speakers. I don't consider myself a speaker here. I consider myself somebody who is behind the scene, who was, who was impelling, perhaps coming up originally with the idea, but then carried out by Alexander, by Georgie, by Nora, and by my other colleagues of the Institute. So I'm, I'm, I'm really behind the scenes. And I'm here to, to express my deep hope, satisfaction, and joy, actually, and what I have been hearing and what I continue to hear. That's all I need to say. Thank you so much, Irvin, for that. And I'm wondering, uh, could we bring one other uh, of the presenters up with us? Indeed, this would be uh, Rabbi Gedalia Gurfin, who is standing in for his colleague, David Geffen, Rabbi Geffen, who had the video with us yesterday. This way we would be able to have the voice of the rabbi who would be able to share also any questions that might arise for uh, the Jewish perspective um, or anything in line with what uh, David Geffen presented yesterday. Well, so can, maybe we can continue with the round. Who would like to take the question again uh, next? Uh, what have you learned or experienced in this symposium that augments your ability to human well? And please feel free to uh, take this in any direction you wish. What occurs to me is, is, is really something I've been describing for the last couple of years. When, we, when COVID really um, stopped us in our tracks, I began to sense that it was an evolutionary agency. You know, one of the, the smallest and most ancient of Gaia's children a virus was stopping us in a way that nothing else had. And I started to tune in to what this might be bringing forward. And what I was sensing was not a crisis, but a potential metamorphosis. I had a sense that we had an opportunity as a collective species to enter a sort of a, 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 a death and rebirth process of breaking down and breaking through. And of course, that's what caterpillars do when they go into a cocoon, they dissolve themselves and then they re-emerge as, as butterflies. And so what I've been sensing into these last couple of years and including the, the, the war in Ukraine, which I agree with Thomas, is, is really a reflective of our 
the unhealed aspects of our collective psyche to say, now what do we do? Um, is that it, two years ago, I could sense the, what is called the imaginal cells of, of, of metamorphosis coming forward. But over these last period of time, I've been seeing those imaginal cells joining up, linking up and lifting up together to form imaginal organelles and to, you know, to begin to sort of shape this emergent collective body of what we could become. So what this weekend has offered me is, is in a sense, a verification of that, the validation of that, the, the deep work of, of healing our collective trauma and both on individual and collective levels that we ha still have to do, mm -hmm. have to do, but also that potential evolutionary arc that awaits us when we are progressively waking up to remember we're inseparable. Thank you, June. Elena, so just so we know, I'll be facilitating this first round and then Georgie will take us through the second round of questions. Elena. Well, what a wonderful question. I want to follow up uh, on uh, what Jude just offered us and say that that's really what I found most enriching in these two days, the evidence of the vast wave of linking up and lifting up. From my perspective, this call to a global universal consciousness and universal love was first released to a modern humanity in the middle of the 19th century. And when we talked <clears throat> today about a new culture, the first communities of this new culture that embraced the concept of universal citizenship, global citizenship, global love and global consciousness emerged in very dark places and are still not well known now in Iraq and Iran. And these were people that were tormented and persecuted. 20,000 of them were put to death within two decades of the emergence of this Baha'i understanding in the middle of the 19th century that the time has come for humanity to unite not around its partial loyalties, but around a global sense of citizenship to Gaia, universal love, and a global sense of justice for everybody. And so this thing began in the darkest and most invisible of places. And today we hear evidence of such a multiplicity of efforts that have spread and encompassed the planet. And from various angles, traditions, wisdom perspectives, scientific perspectives, blends of wisdom and scientific perspectives are in fact carrying the movement forward. And um, several things in that regard that I also want to share. I was very uh, heartened. And, and by the way, David, I specifically wanted to say I'm Bulgarian and I love the work of uh, Ben Saduno. Uh, Dunuf, Peter Dunuf, and what he spoke about in terms of this new culture really, as I just mentioned, began probably half a century before his teachings. But he was um, a remarkable spiritual intuitive, and he tried to translate that into the context of a very torn and very historically encumbered encumbered Bulgarian society, but that's just, I'd love to communicate with you more one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, another thing that I found very heartening is how in both today's and yesterday's uh, musical interludes, what we are speaking about was so beautifully embodied through music. And it, uh, it really took us places that cannot be spoken. Um, I think you said that uh, beautifully, um, Alexander, how can we access the ineffable flame within? Well, definitely the music helped do that. Um, I was also very heartened to hear as part of this conversation and the spreading of, of global consciousness and universal love, the understanding of the power and necessity to heal. Because... Really, Baha'u'llah first spoke in the middle of the uh, 19th century about this tremendous historical trauma that humanity carries and that we're just not going to be able to transcend it. We're going to have to own it and heal it. And he spoke about healing it in the human hearts and human communities, but also healing it in our environments, which is our Gaia, our, our planetary environments. And so... Uh, to hear the work of uh, 
very beloved Thomas Hubel represented here and how he spoke about collective permafrost resists evolution and we cannot leap into this new stage of consciousness. We actually have to go through the hard work which we're feeling and living right now as well. So I thought these were all wonderful, very, very heartening examples for me of something that um, started actually long before most people are aware of it. In my recent book, Global Unity Healing, which uh, just received the, the Nautilus Award, uh, Silver Award for Rising to the Moment, I tried to describe the, u- the roots of this unity of consciousness in the 19th century and what it means for modern humanity in terms of both individual and also community, national and global healing. And I'd like to close what I'm sharing with a statement uh, which was made by Abdul Baha in Paris to a very large global gathering in 1911, but in which he actually summarized these teachings that were released to the modern consciousness in the middle of the 19th century. Because this statement really sums up everything that was spoken today from so many different angles and perspectives, and it was also sung. So it goes like this. All God's prophets have brought the message of love. There are many ways of expressing the love principle. There is love for family, for the country, for the race. There is political political enthusiasm. There is also the love of community of interest in service. Love is unlimited, boundless, infinite. Material things are limited, circumscribed, finite. The love of family is limited. The tie of blood relations is not the strongest bond. Patriotic love is finite. The love of one's country causing hatred of all others is not perfect love. The love of race is limited. To love our own race may mean hatred for all others. And even people of the same race often dislike each other. Political love also is much bound up with hatred of one party for another. The love of community of interest in service is likewise fluctuating. Frequently competitions arise which lead to jealousy and at length hatred replaces love. The great unselfish love for humanity is bounded by none of these imperfect semi-selfish bonds and can only be achieved by the power of the divine spirit. No worldly power can accomplish the universal love. And the summary statement is this. And again, remember, this was proclaimed in the 19th century and we're living it today. That one is indeed a man, translate human being, this is 19th century language. That one is indeed a man who today dedicated himself to the service of the entire human race. It is not for him to pride himself who loved his own country, but rather for him who loved the whole world. The earth is but one country and mankind, its citizens. So here you go, universal consciousness first emerged in the greatest darkness. That is how it always is before dawn. And here we are witnessing 170 years later, such a proliferation and such a wave of growing awareness. So I am very heartened and want to thank you for this opportunity to do human better by being so uplifted in hope. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you so much. We'll get to you, David, one second. Let me make one quick comment here, and then you're up next. Um, Just uh, that uh, we'll be doing this first round. I'm gonna put the question again in the the chat so everyone can see it. Please feel free to take this and to refer to each other. This should also be a conversation. If you want to ask each other to evolve this conversation, uh, we can do that. And again, let's, Let's see if we can make this into something dynamic among us. Um, uh, it, it may be a, a little shorter responses, but that can bring us into interaction and into engagement with each other. How lovely that would be. Well, with that challenge, David, I'll pass it over to you. Ah, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Uh, that's a wonderful contribution, Elena. Um, and uh, I was also put in mind um, of you know, Emerson's <clears throat> uh, essay on the oversoul. Uh, which is probably written in about 1840 something, and this mm-hmm. gave gave rise to the whole new thought movement, the tran- the transcendentalist, the American transcendentalist, the new thought movement, 
And Peter Dernoff spent some time in Boston, where I'm sure he would come across not only theosophists, but also some people who were part of this. And the one, one mind, the universal consciousness, universal mind, um, of which we're all microcosms, this was an, an essential teaching of all these late 19th century thinkers. So that was just to connect up with what you said. I want to connect back to um, what Jude was saying about imaginal cells. Um, this is a book by Bill Plotkin um, that I've just reviewed for the next issue of the journal called The Journey of Soul Initiation. And it goes through the phases of preparation for the descent, descent into the canyon, into the darkness, into the inscape, dissolution, soul encounter, metamorphosis and enactment and it's an, it's an extraordinary book but the point I wanted to come back to really I think relates to where we are at the moment uh, and that is that uh, he writes here on page 344 um, our socio-cultural structures have been dissolving for quite some time this dissolution is a necessary phase in cultural transformation this dissolution is a necessary phase in cultural transformation. And he then says, um, what percentage uh, of adults and elders, because we were got a shortage of adults and elders, as imaginal cells are needed to give in, in a given egocentric dominator society, which is what we live in using uh, Rian Eisler um, terminology, as it decays and dissolves, before the society begins to metamorphose into a mature partnership society. So this is going from the, uh, the, 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 the blade to the chalice, um, from dominator to partnership mode. And then this, this I think, is a really interesting um, observation, which ties back into my left and right hand columns. Just as the caterpillar's immune system resists its own imaginal cells, resists its own imaginal cells, uh, which it sees as a threat and consequently tries to kill. So an egocentric caterpillar culture will do all it can to resist and eliminate its adults and elders. Indeed, this is what dominated societies have been doing for several thousand years. If the map presented in this book is effective and widely accepted, the egocentric dominator powers will do all they can to sabotage, censor, and suppress it. But what he then goes on to say is that we need to understand this resistance to the new from by the old and existing systems as a source of strength so that we, are, we can draw strength from this insight and, and then embed ourselves in, as one of our speakers said, in, in, the, in these higher frequencies. And it's so easy to be dragged down into the, into, as it were, the lower frequencies, the, the third dimension as opposed to the fifth dimension, that, that, that this is obviously where we need to, to have our focus individually and, and collectively. And so I, I think this metaphor of the imaginal selves, I have a podcast called Imaginal Inspirations, um, where I've interviewed about 25 plus people. Um, and Jude will get, get you on around the time of your uh, book coming out as an example. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm really enjoying this, <laughs> this interaction. Thank you, David. Uh, let's see who else would like to uh, continue with the conversation. Yeah. Uh, Marty. Uh, yeah, I want to insert something here. Um, and I don't mean to offend anybody, uh, but my students um, who might be listening <laughs> understand my style here. Um, I, I think that what is really key and what I keep thinking of throughout the whole weekend is the requirement that we modern humans remember how to have an experience. We keep going for the definitions and we love our words and we forget the fact that neurologically language is created out of sensory input. So we can say these lovely things, but if we're not aware of the sensory input, the experience that brought us to these statements, then we're nowhere. And so I would encourage everyone, because I think everyone's had this experience through the weekend, that some things that have been said have really touched each and every one of us. But instead of staying with the words themselves, can you identify 
what you felt, what experience came up in your own protoplasm. You know? How deeply can you bring your awareness to realize what your experience is and what the world is telling you, what the universe is telling you about you and your role in a conscious universe? And, and I think that this goes to, um, to something, this is a very long topic, so I'll try to be really brief here. I'm thinking of the, the very brilliant comments about trauma and how in order to, we say, clear trauma, we have to go into it and experience it, not explain it, but experience it. Because in our bodies and ourselves, we, we understand. We have this thing called trauma because we've had experiences that we cannot process. Right. And so even what we call trauma, I would reframe as an engagement with power and being conscious people, conscious elements in a conscious universe. We are expressions of power. We engage power. And I think what we're really talking about is regaining our capacity to be in conversation with power. As power sources, as part of larger powers, to be in relationship experientially with the world. And I think this is a, it's a deep current underneath everything that we're doing. And I just wanted to encourage people to track that in themselves. Marty, thank you. Oh my goodness. Well, this is exactly what this symposium is about. It's not just about consciousness. It's about sentience and consciousness. Yeah. And you put your finger right on it. That's exactly why this is a, a, a symposium about sentience and consciousness. And there have been, Jude has talked about uh, how our superpower is called intuition. Uh, she shared that uh, uh, phrasing before. And, and uh, Anne has talked about the, the conscious communion with metaphysical reality. Um, all of these, these sensed, felt ways. But good, who else would like to uh, pick up on this or in any other way share a response to the question? Pavel, you're hesitating to, un yes, go right ahead. You see, I knew yes, you were going to. Uh, just want to, because I, I have a, a brief, uh, a brief uh, thought, but maybe that will be more of a question to all of us. And I think that what we are doing on one hand is uh, we are illuminating uh, some of the major blind spots uh, for uh, our society and uh, that presently uh, block uh, the potential for collective evolution in this forum. But uh, I wonder what are some of the blind spots to us? And uh, one of the things that were, was uh, very evident for me, the, where I think I was learning a lot from uh, uh, the presentation by Thomas when he started to speak about this uh, permafrost idea, and the fact uh, that that uh, an enormous uh, amount of uh, energy and human potential is now frozen, and while we try to design uh, better human systems and better learning experiences, we seem to ignore that greatest, let's say, uh, uh, reserve of collective energy that that actually would move us to that next evolutionary stage. So I'm uh, now sitting with the question is how, how can we learn to, to, to help uh, support this uh, collective healing process alongside with uh, uh, productive future now kind of visioning that uh, Thomas was talking about. In that regard, Marty also resonated with your words about uh, the fact that we can get lost in, in these words and nice images and kind of lull ourselves into mm -hmm. into a beautiful but disconnected image yeah. of what is possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. And, you know, in, in answer to um, how we go about all this, the, I always come back to what I call original human wisdom. Humans used to consult the universe. They used to go out into nature and learn from the ways nature maintained its own healed state. And there is a, a teaching in the Andean traditions that our healed state is dependent on our connectivities. So are we connected into the world? Are we in positive relationship with one another, with nature, with, with basically with everything? And are we being informed by the other rather than by the ego? 
And, and what we find in indigenous cultures is, is that that kind of connectivity um, informs the human structure so it remembers its own healed state. And that's a personal healing, collective healing, the whole thing. So we, we have a shift. My view is we have a shift to make. We have to remember how to use our awareness correctly. And I think that's, that's a very big thing and it's gonna take some generations. But um, Pavel, I, I love how you brought the question forward and how you're observing what we're doing and how we talk about our work. Uh, we need to track ourselves in that way, absolutely. And I think be the role models for this kind of connectivity. Please, Judy. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. It was Marty who was just saying about role models. Um, some years back, two dear friends, um, Adam Hall and Kit Thomas, hosted a, a salon for myself and Barbara Marks Hubbard in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And we had a wonderful exploration dialogue. And, and, and some of these questions and explorations came up. And afterwards, a lovely lady approached us and very kindly said, to us, you're my role models. And then she said, ah, oh, no, you're my soul models. Mm -hmm. And it, it ever since this has reverberated, resonated deep within me, because it goes back to this point about our own vulnerability, our own blind spots, our own journey, which we're all on. And perhaps what we can, we can actually commit to being are authentic, transparent, and serving soul models on this journey not as leaders, but as fellow travellers on this journey of homecoming. So I just wanted to bring that in because it seems that it goes, I think, back to something you said about words, because for me, it's about understanding experience, experiencing and embodying unitive consciousness. And our own journeys can hopefully serve and support others um, on our collective journey forward. So just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I just really enjoyed the last couple of days and just listening to everyone's conversation. I just want to sort of bring in a concept that has been talked about, but without actually using the words. And that is about understanding the heart energy. You know, part of my work is very much about understanding that our hearts have an electromagnetic field that speaks to each other and to ourselves and so there's a communication that goes on within the heart and that heart energy also communicates with Gaia and it communicates with the cosmos it communicates with the universal energy and that is what brings us all back into balance and so really we need to come back I believe to really, really understanding the heart and not just as a concept and not just as a theory. So many beautiful words are used here and all of it resonates. And I'm sure we can all resonate with each other's words and, and the ways that we're expressing it because we are all of the same heart set. And I think the challenge really is how do we reach the wider audience who are not really interested in speaking about consciousness. They are more interested in, you know, the sort of material experiences. And we need to bring balance into that space by really, really elevating the heart energy, elevating consciousness through the heart connection which doesn't need words so that we are able to communicate which is similar to soul modeling you know it's when we're around it's similar to connecting with nature what is it that happens when we're in nature we're connecting to something much much deeper what is it when we're around people who resonate with us who elevate us who lift our spirits who lift our consciousness we are connecting on a deeper level. And so that is a thing that I feel we really need to be bringing into these conversations and also looking at how we can reach beyond the, the people who are already vibrating and resonating on this level and to be able to go out into the world and bring them into this level of consciousness so that we are not just speaking to each other and with each other, but we are speaking to those who are ready on some level, but don't know because language is lost on them. When we speak a certain language, 
they can feel overwhelmed and they can feel it's too much. The thought of healing can be too much and we know that's what's needed. And so that would be my question, that that is what I feel we need to be addressing um, so that we reach a much, much wider audience, those who really need it, because they're the ones who are stuck in the darkness. We have a light that gives us hope, that gives us a sense of what's possible for humanity. And, and it's really about reaching those who have lost that hope or are losing hope. How do we bring it back to them? Thank you, Hema. Wonderful. Um, Fred, to you, then to Anne, and if there's time, we'll, we'll check in with Elena again. Yeah, um, I actually don't know what I learned exactly. Consciousness is a very mysterious thing that we have not really able to grasp, and certainly not in the form of language. Knowing and languaging what we know is a gap, but it, it, it arises in my in my consciousness, my my intuition as a ascension. It's something that you felt, but you can't exactly say what you have learned about how you have felt. It might take time for it to percolate through uh, into a form that we can work with. But one thing that occurs to me, there is increasing number of invitation for human awakening. You know, I was um, invited to and participate in this global consciousness institution movement, which I, your brother is involved. And we had discussions of similar nature, not exactly a topic, but similar nature. And this thing is sprouting up everywhere. I don't know whether I'm attracting it or attracting me, but there is a sense that it comes into me that this is the time for us to choose our course of action with determination. I don't know what I've learned, but I know my determination to choose has strengthened, that this is the time. Mm -hmm. that we have to choose and act and not wait. As I said, I don't know what I've learned. I don't know how it works, but my determination has strengthened. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Yes, indeed. This is a time. There are attractors. There's a field emerging that we are emerging into and co-creating. This is uh, absolutely, absolutely the case. Um, let me pass this on to uh, Anne. I've been greatly heartened to listen to everyone and to learn. I've had a great deal confirmed, which has been on sort of what my own work has been. It's been confirmed by everyone who's spoken here. I still see a huge gap between all of us and the majority in the world who are lost in mental illness, a great deal of mental illness, huge amounts of antidepressants being taken uh, in the UK. Um, and wondering how to bridge that huge gap between people who are living in survival mode, because that is the mode that most people are living in in the world. They don't know of any other. And how do we move them from survival mode into soul mode? How do we make them aware that they're part of what Jude was saying, something so huge, so immense, so extraordinary as this conscious universe? And, and I think the pamphlet that Jude is writing, I think, needs to have inspiration. It needs to have a combination of what we've all been saying, not in length particularly, just short paragraphs in which we can state what human beings are and what they could become and lift them out of this survival mode. I think that's one of the things. I think the most important thing also is to move from the head to the heart, what Hema was saying, and that the heart is far more extraordinary than we have any idea of. And also, as I said in my talk, the heart is the conduit to the right hemisphere of the brain and beyond that to the soul. So they're linked, those three things, the heart, the right hemisphere and the soul. And there again, that could be taught in even in schools. I'm teaching it to my grandson. So a method of teaching, a simple method, something that is not talking down, but talking with the world, as it were. What is our predicament? 
how can we resolve it? I'm also reminded of alchemy. We're in the Negredo phase at the moment, but we're getting a glimpse of the next phase, which is the albedo, the whitening, the clarifying, the um, learning, the opening. This is exciting. This is what we're talking about here these last two days is about the albedo, really. And that could be communicated, again, in, in simple language to people, I think. So I think we have to focus on communicating, a method of communicating, not merely in books. It has to be done somehow through the media, through uh, videos, possibly. And, I mean, Evan has done a huge amount, as we know, to bring us all together and to write his books and to bring his consciousness into the world. But there is an urgency and I think Ukraine has constellated that emergency because we are seeing each, we are seeing in Ukraine what we can descend into and what we can rise to in the huge resistance to the, to the Russian invasion. So that is a true negredo um, taking place there, but it's also a huge awakening to us and it's opening our heart because we feel such compassion for what's up with the suffering, not only of the Ukrainians, but of the Russian soldiers who were sent to be killed, these young boys of 2021. And I personally want to rise to the point of, of um, arousing all the mothers of the world to speak up against the loss of their sons, mm -hmm. because I think it's an absolute outrage that women should be asked to sacrifice what they have taken 20 years to create to love, to nurture, to, to care for, and all of a sudden that life is just gone, sacrificed. I mean, what a trauma, uh, what trauma to, to the 20,000 young Russians who've been killed, 20,000 mothers are mourning those sons. And the same with Ukraine, people who've been shot and killed, and raped and murdered. Mm -hmm. So there are things that can be done in the practical sense. And I would say, rouse the mothers, to uh, speak up about, and that's coming from the heart, by the way. <laughs> so that's, that's all I have to say, really. But thank you so much for everything that each one of you has contributed. Thank you for the wisdom, uh, the, the depth of knowledge that Jude is bringing, and, and Pavel also, and the tenderness of the hearts that all of us are, I think, exhibiting, um, which is about the albedo as well. It's the awakening of the heart and the awakening and the power of the moment of choice, which I've written about for the last three or four years during the, the uh, COVID, is a time of choice being offered to us by COVID and by Ukraine as well, by what's happening. So thank you. And thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to now transition over to Georgie, but before I do, with, a, with one comment over here to, to share. First of all, I'm going to beg your indulgence, uh, Elena and Gedalia, perhaps, uh, we can bring you into the next round of questions just so we can have a chance to move a little bit and you can have Jerji as your, uh, your catalyst and facilitator for a bit, which will be very nice. Uh, but uh, just a little reflection here, what, what uh, everyone has been saying, what, uh, the expression of gratitude that uh, Anne has also shared just now, really is directed to all of us and to all of those who are listening as well. We are the ones that we have been waiting for, as the expression goes. And this is not... A, any form of superiority that we and others know, no, this is not that at all, but it is a time of embodied and acted interbeing. And this is about humaning well, individually and collectively. It's what Pavel was talking about as well. And this is one of the questions of how do we human well? And one of the comments in, in uh, the, uh, the chat also talked about engaging in dialogue. Uh, Kimberly Chapel was mentioning, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we engage in the dialogue, this dialogue with, as Fred has shared with us, the Tao or the way and uh, the bigger becoming of our cosmos. So with that, um, oh, and just to mention one last thing here, um, in education, we, we talked, touched on that a little bit, and the idea that is normally in education, we put such an emphasis on learning a skill set. And at times we also complement that with the reflective component of questioning our mindsets. But how often do we explore what Hema was talking about as our heart sets? And how can we bring that also into our learning environments and create those systemic nurturance spaces that elicit, evoke, uh, and inspire and empower 
that being in us all. Uh, Georgie, thank you. I'll pass it over to you uh, for our next round. Uh, thank you so much, Alexander. What a rich conversation. Wonderful. I know we're going to dig a little, little bit deep for another 20 minutes. Uh, we have uh, two questions uh, uh, prepared, uh, but before uh, that, I'd like to just share a, a little bit uh, of my experience around, I think it was 20 years ago when I met Hema, and I had some partial awakening, and, and I was so excited that I just wanted to enlighten everybody, and I said to Hema, that, oh my gosh, oh my God, and she just said, don't push it, Georgie, don't push it, because those who are not there yet, they, they actually push you back, and they don't understand you, just lead by example. And that just came to me now that as you finished, Alexander, that one of the best ways to lead by example, and, and that's just what I did, or maybe partially I did really, since her advice. So uh, two questions. Alexander, would you mind to put those two questions in a chat box so everybody can see it? So the first one, these are related and unrelated, as, as you wish, and uh, to understand. Question number one, what was the most salient thing you learned from this weekend? This is a question for your mind. This relates to the question, what has risen to consciousness? Number two, what is the most salient thing you are sensing from this weekend? This is not a question for the head, but does your body have to say? What does your body have to say? So what is informing your sense of being right now? So I know that partially Fred almost answered question number one, but let's actually dig a little bit deeper and really talk about you. What have you actually learned? What it is that's something new that, uh, that, that by anybody who said, or maybe uh, an audience uh, comments from the chat box, what it is that you would like to share as a consciousness-related experience or a sentience-related feeling? Emma, please go ahead. To answer the first question, if I can just... The sense, I would say, is beauty. You know, what has come through each speaker, the music, the way you've all presented. And beauty is a language. It's not about the aesthetics. For me, it's about a flow in, in, of energy in the body. And when, when my body's flowing, I feel a sense of beauty. So everything that I see, feel, sense here creates more beauty in, in myself, my sense of the world that I'm living in. And what was the most, most important aspect of this whole experience has been really, really the sense of evolution, that we are evolving even as we look at other things that are going on, like the wars and COVID, et cetera, et cetera we're evolving we're evolving because we're having these conversations we're evolving because more and more people are involved and more and more people are expanding the knowledge that we already have that adds to the knowledge that we have the knowingness that we have the understanding that we have but most of all to the experience that we have and when experience is embodied when we experience and embody the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions that's when we become integrated and so there's a real sense of integration as a result of the whole sort of experience from start to finish and I know it's not finished yet but it's it's beautiful and and definitely the music and the sound element is also absolutely essential and I, I absolutely love all of the talks and all of the chats but also the music thank you so much mm -hmm. thank you Emma. so what i've learned i've learned of new strands of amazing work that i didn't know about and that has made me so very happy so that's what i've learned and 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 discovered what I have sensed is I have sensed myself constantly smiling and over, overflowing with the desire to smile more. So there's a, the level of joy that's bubbling up inside of me that's just uh, beyond any explaining. So I've sensed great joy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're reflecting uh, each other joyously with love and smiling a lot. Uh, Anybody else, Marty? Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to give a radical answer as usual. I can't answer the first question separately because I believe that everything we learn, we have learned directly through our senses. So they're not two separate questions. And so the most important thing that I'm sensing or learning via direct experience is that the momentum that is building in humanity to wake up again, the momentum is positive. It's not weak anymore. It hasn't lost. It is gaining strength. And if we pay attention to it, we can steward it beautifully. Very well said. Thank you so much. Fred, how are you feeling and thinking about these two questions? I sense that um, um, that uh, there is a gradual um, coming together of the energy throughout the period. That I suppose that is how it unfolds. That the level of honesty has increased over time which is what human being has to do. And we are very careful tiptoeing around each other, but it has improved through the conversation. It is what we need to build an energetic trust among ourselves, a resonance that we needed. Thank you. I sense that the field is listening to all of us. And I sense that our message is strengthening the field and what it would like to hear (laughs) because it's had to wait an awful long time, maybe 4,000 years before a group like us could come together and and talk about the things we have. So I find it uh, deeply moving, deeply illuminating, and also uh, deeply questioning how is it going to go from here? Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jude? Thank you, everyone. Uh, It was something that you said, Anne, about the field just now that I resonated with, because over the last few years, I've been invited to participate in a lot of constellation work. And constellation work really began uh, to, to look at family trauma and how to heal that. But over the last few years, it's really moved forward. It itself has evolved, I feel. So that the work that I've been involved with is archetypal constellation work and what's called blind constellation work in which a group of people enter that field of consciousness, essentially not knowing what they represent. But then what happens is the field informs them in response to a question of exploration. And in that sense, it's a felt experience, Marty, because you don't know who you're supposed to be. So you can't be in your head. You literally have to, <laughs> have to allow your body, your, sent, your sentience and your sentience to respond. And I would suggest when we talk about how we might come together more and more as circles of healing, as holonic circles of exploration, that... Um, constellation work is is potentially an aspect of that because if somebody hasn't done it before and they've been in their heads and they're invited into that experience it is such an aha moment because it confounds everything they thought they knew about the nature of reality and yet in an incredibly benevolent and positive way so i do feel that the last few years um we've been learning to link up and lift up together We've been doing so to to bring forward a perspective, not just of our personal expanded sense of awareness, but moving more and more into a group felt sense of empathy and awareness. And my goodness me, we've got a long journey ahead of us, but I'm incredibly enthused and encouraged that we're on this journey together. Thank you so much, Jude. When Anne said that uh, she feels that the field is listening, I think that... uh, um, we need to listen to the field. And also that uh, what came right after this total feeling, rather, that uh, what we need to ask what life really wants uh, from us, not what we want from life. And this is what Viktor Frankl said, isn't it? So it is that... Uh, mm-hmm. that, that anyway, I, I saw that, David, you put your hand up, so go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Um, my sense is that I've, 
I've been reminded of um, a talk I gave in 2009 when there was an initial um, MERS SARS scare and the, 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 the sort of the emergent uh, biopolitical security agenda, which is what we're <clears throat> being fed at the moment. Um, and I, I, I took as my starting point what Jesus said in the Gospels. He said, be ye wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And the way I interpreted this, and I see Janice in the um, audience there. Um, I gave talk um, in the context of Rekin Trust. Um, the way I interpreted it, this is that we need to know uh, what is going on geopolitically and not be naive about what the elite people have in what they pl are planning in terms of our future. So we, we, need to, we need to be aware of this. And, and, but at the same time, we don't want to be putting our major focus on it. Otherwise, we'll be thinking all the time what we can be against uh, as opposed to what we can do positively. And that's where the gentle as doves comes in. And so the way I interpret that is that we need to be building the field, everything that everybody's been saying here, um, building the field. We need to do it knowingly, strategically, and, and uh, in a way that um, really produces the maximum synergy. And I don't know quite how to do all this. Uh, we're all, this is part of a big effort. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of organizations and circles need to come together um, around a diverse but, but nevertheless coherent evolutionary agenda, maybe using the principles that, that, that uh, uh, were suggested by Barbara Marx Hubbard of you know, moving towards greater consciousness, freedom, and loving order. Um, and But part of the picture that I think people need to understand is put in, is in this book, this absolutely extraordinary book that I'm reading um, at the moment called States of Emergency and, and Keeping the Global Population in Check. And the point about the main point of this book um, is that we've moved from one state of emergency. Um, I mean, this was, this was actually written before that, but you know, in, with COVID, which is still with us. And we're now in a, in a, in a Ukraine state of emergency. And who knows what's coming next? You know, to try and, um, and but we mustn't be disempowered. We mustn't be disempowered. We must stand in the power of love and inspiration um, that we've been been talking about. Uh, and so that's a question we can ask ourselves. You know, how how can they be wise as serpents and gentle as doves? Yeah, thank you. Spot on. Absolutely, David. Thank you. I would like to uh, bring in uh, Rabbi Gedale. I'm sure you have a lot to say. Please share your thoughts and feelings with us. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I have not been involved in this project. Uh, I kind of came in as a substitute for my buddy who was unable to make it. And yesterday I was in a different zone called Shabbat. So I was really only able to participate just a little bit here. But I, I am a quick learner. Um, I don't have much to say because my teacher always told me that God made us with two ears and one mouth, so we should learn to listen twice as much as we talk. So I've been doing a lot of listening. Uh, but as a quick learner, um, I would like to just thank everybody for completely screwing up my head because I'm a yeshiva guy. I just sit here in Jerusalem. I spend most of my time learning the Zohar and Talmud. And suddenly, poof, I've been thrown into this other world, kind of like inside the middle of a whale, all of a sudden here. And uh, now I know there's a tremendous more amount of information I still don't know. So thank you very much for ruining my day. That's really been, I can't thank you enough. However, I do want to say on a sensory level, because in Jewish thought, the cradle of wisdom is the heart. The brain is only a facilitator and a processor, but the actual scale of sensitivity as to whether or not that wisdom is also true is processed through the heart. So what I feel in this um, unusual environment for me to be in is that there are very deep rivers running here. There's very, very, very deep rivers that are running here. And there are extraordinary people who are um, 
representatives of many of the various, I'll just say in simple English, zodiac energies that facilitate life on this planet. And the convergence of such diversity is really the root of redemption. So it's an extraordinary moment to be here. And, and I thank you for it. But I would like to just maybe throw a little tidbit in, especially on something that Anne said, who I enjoyed very much because I had a chance to listen more to her and also to David, who I enjoyed very much in the previous round. And that is a little bit about the Kabbalistic approach to feminine power. Many people are unaware, or maybe they are aware, and I just don't know that, but everybody has been a man and everybody has been a woman in one of their various incarnations. And every soul is a combination of part man, part woman. There's no such thing as man or woman. And a combination of a male-female soul is sometimes placed in a male facility, body, or a female facility. But without having woman in male, there's no way man could talk to woman or vice versa. So when we bump up that level of energy to the highest of levels in the spherot, we come to the level that's called mother, bina, which is the highest of all levels and the source of all wisdom. And so that power of woman is always taught in Kabbalah that when not just womanhood, but higher than womanhood, motherhood, as you refer to the crying mothers, which really went very deep in, in anyone who lives in Israel, knows what crying mothers are all about. So that really reminded me that we have a tradition that will only be actually through the power of the mother that the ultimate redemption will come. And this is why man, meaning now male, is always associated with war, whereas female, these words don't really work in my language, but I'm, I'm using English here, whereas female is a much more refined and higher superior. I mean, my background is in technology, so I'll just say that the, the woman or female energy is the 2.0. Man was only the 1.0. Man hmm. was created, male was created from earth, but woman was created from man. Therefore, she's a greater uh, bridge between the higher and the lower worlds. And therefore, when her energy gains access and shows the stupidity and futility of war in all of its subcategories, that's something that really brings a, a great blessing into the world. So I bless everybody. It's all I can do. I'm a Jew from Jerusalem. What can I do? So I just bless everybody that, you know, I'll bless you with a little Hasidic story quickly, if I may. There was a great Hasidic master known as Reb Zusha. And Reb Zusha used to say, when I go before God after 120 years, as that number doesn't seem so far away anymore at this point in my life. So as I come before God, he's not going to ask me why I wasn't Moses. Mm. He's not going to ask me why I wasn't Hillel, Arabia, Kiva. He's going to ask me why I wasn't Zusha. In other words, it's extremely important to think very big, but it's equally as important to deliver the small little steps that make it happen. In Hebrew, we say the difference between a visionary and a dreamer is that a visionary knows how to pay his electric bills while accomplishing his dream. So therefore, <laughs> it's very important to yeah, stay rooted step by step with a tremendous global vision. And here's the last thing. I know I said that, but I'm Jewish. I'm sorry. So uh, I was trained by my Rebbe to always pay close attention to people's names because they reveal tremendous amount. And the founder of this organization, and his name is, you see, in New York, we would spell Irvin with an I, but he spells it with an E. So it's Irvin with an E. Now that word Irvin in he is a Hebrew word, <clears throat> which means an Eruv. An Eruv means to be able to create a facility that encompasses all the elements involved. And so therefore to have a founder of an organization that can pluck from so many different religions and cultures and, and all of the rest of it and create the facility in which they can now harmonize and become a sum total, which is greater than the whole rather than the sum total of the parts is a very appropriate name and a very good sign that this is an organization on the right track. So I bless you. It should only be that you wake up tomorrow greater than you are today. Thank you very much. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank yes, you sir. for you. Thank you for your words, for your smiles, and for joy. Thank you. And thank, you for jo thank you for joining us. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left. So if I may ask uh, Pavel and Elena to, to really have a very succinct <laughs> contribution, I would really much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Gedena. Uh, that reminded me of 
a friend of mine, uh, Rabbi Meir Brook from New York, who speaks about sparks that exist in this world, and like the God has distributed the sparks on many traditions, and it's our job to bring them all together. And uh, I strongly resonated with these words of the role of visionaries that need to go and implement. The, the main feeling that I have uh, at the end is not to lose this energy, not to, to have a container to carry it forward. And that's what I want, would like to encourage organizers to make sure we're not dispersing this energy. Some of it, but also keeping it for greater action. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. I agree. Elena. Following up on the container to carry this energy forward, there was also a note here saying we need a design sprint to identify a common platform for all these ideas. And also David, who was saying we cannot forget uh, um, or ignore what the global elite is also planning. We don't want to focus there, but we can't ignore it. Um, in, in line with all of these things, as I loved the concept of the deep rivers uh, running, thank you, Rabbi, these deep rivers can actually, one of the ways in which we could pool our resources, there is a new synergy circle that is starting now and Jude will be involved in it along with myself and hopefully many of you, which is uh, focused on unitive justice and global governance. So these are ways to address these deep rivers of consciousness and sentience, but really also in very concrete ways in the world we're living in now in terms of global governance that is going to really move things from the hands of this elite and from the hands of warmongering lobbies. So unity of justice and global governance is a synergy circle that is starting. For those of you who are interested, please contact me and I would love to share more. And uh, that's just one of the ways in which we can actually channel this energy in very practical ways. And before we end, I did want to honor the question that was raised in the previous round. How do we reach the wider audience that is not really interested in thinking about consciousness. People in the notes were also saying people at the grassroots are doing so much, but sometimes the language, the intellectual language doesn't quite bring them along. And how do we reach another person said, uh, beyond the people who are not resonating at this level, because this language is lost on them. I think this is a very important question we can't bypass. Personally, one way that I've found to do that is in my book, In Global Unity of Healing, the whole book is based on case vignettes, actually, of, uh, of people who have come through anxiety and depression and have awakened their consciousness to their own and then global and unity of healing. Every chapter has a vignette, and the idea is this is all geared at ordinary people who's, who can relate to the experience of these other ordinary people and can see that there is a bridge for them. And I was moved to do that when the pandemic began because I, I re resonate so much with this question. Okay, we have this wonderful feeling here, but what about the world out there? And so uh, to me, I, I've had to find a way to speak to the suffering and, and accompany this process. And so that's just my response. It's just one little effort. There's probably many ways to do this, but I think it's an effort we can't question, we can't ignore or forget. So thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, Elena. Very, very important points. We have plenty of work ahead of us and uh, we already uh, do uh, a lot in that regard. Uh, clearly, together, we can achieve uh, much more than separately. So this uh, symposium is uh, one etap, one, uh, one, one start or maybe continuum. And uh, we, we keep on working together and uh, form a greater unity. Now, if Alexander agrees, I would like to invite uh, our dear Erwin Laszlo in Hungarian. Actually, we say his name Erwin. Just in English, we say Erwin. So it is, his name is Erwin. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Erwin, Erwin, with a special name and to share his uh, thoughts and feelings and just summing up. I was a great believer in this case, in, in, in listening. We got together a group here that we hoped will bring forward important issues and we'll have some ideas as to how to approach them. 
this expectation was more and more, more, much more fulfilled than I ever would have expected. This is a, a group that has, could create history if it became known what it's saying, what, what its message would become known. The very fact that it's taking place, that it has taken place, is a remarkable sign of the coming of healing, healing as a, as a prolegomena to evolution. I want to say a couple of things here very, very briefly. What we have assumed all the way through, and I don't know if I've stated it, anybody has stated it very explicitly, but you've assumed that the sentience, which I'm very grateful to Alexander for bringing that into the title, this concept, that sentience is universal. Sentience is characteristic of this universe. This is a sentient universe. Consciousness, as I see it, as I feel it almost, is how sentience is evolving, what sentience is evolving into. It is reaching a level unprecedented on this earth in the human species, but its sentience is universal. And we feel each other. We feel the rest of the world. I use the word the term in the same way that uh, Alfred North Whitehead uses feeling also, there's a kind of prehension he also said. We feel, we are part of a feeling world. And this world is not a passive world, not a world where anything goes. This world is a highly oriented world. It is a world that is moving in a direction. This direction can be well described as coherence, and love, coherence as a kind of an, an outside external denomination, calling that coherence. The way we feel it is by moving toward experiencing love and the heart showing the way to the brain and showing the way to the interaction to the rest of the universe. All things are oriented towards coherence. That means that all things are oriented toward love. I'm engaged these days in working a little bit in the garden. Voltaire, I think, said, occupez-vous de vos jardins. I'm not trying to do only that, but among other things, I also do that and it gives me a great deal of pleasure. But I feel that when I pick out a flower that didn't have its place there because it's supposed to be lawn over there and not a white flower, that I better not do it. First of all, because it's beautiful, but also because its flower is an expression of life. Everything that grows. And sometimes the plants grow, even flowers grow in the craps between a cement plate and a driveway. Amazing how everything grows. Everything is moving forward. This is a universe that is evolving evolving whether we know it or not, even whether we work with it or not, but it's not a universe that's predetermined. I'm very sure, fairly certain about that. It's not something that has already decided. We still have a role of how it moves forward. And that role is very simple. And the Eastern religions tell it, tell it to us very simply. They tell us, let go, allow it to surface. Put your feelings, put your ambitions, put your short-term short -term wants on, in the back burner. Allow this deeper sense of who we are, who the universe, what the universe is, allow it to emerge. This trial that we are passing through, this trauma, is a further challenge to evolution. It's actually, it's a prototype, it's a movement, it's a signal for evolution. What we have got to prevent is the, is the sacrifice, is the suffering, is, is the waste in life and in happiness, in, in, in fulfillment. That is to be prevented as much as we can. And that we have a conscious role. We have to go aligned with evolution. But evolution is taking place, and even these, what the French would call contretemps, 
these little hiccups, even that is moving it forward. What is happening is an evolutionary universe is undergoing an evolutionary transformation and we are a part of it. I don't believe, this is my personal belief, but it's a very strong belief and I have had it for many years. I don't believe that the universe has a characteristic called life or called mind or consciousness. I think this universe is mind, is consciousness. It's that feeling which is born into us, which is born into every blade of grass, which is born, was in the quantum particle that emerged after the Big Bang, and which then created the first atomic nuclei, and then the atoms and molecules and cells and, or, and ecosystems and life. That is in it, that is in us. So we have to listen, listen to each other, particularly when such wisdom is being pronounced as we have had here these two days. But listen also to ourselves. We have the wisdom. We are part of an evolving universe which knows how to go forward. It has been created to move forward. We are in a unique, privileged position on this planet and probably on this solar system, but probably not in the galaxy because the galaxies have probably many solar systems, myriads, and some of them could be much more evolved than we are. But at least here we are in a privileged position. We can perceive who we are and what the world is. We can, if we really ask ourselves honest questions and we combine our knowledge with our intuition, then we can move forward. We have had an example here of the last two days of pronouncing many, many words of wisdom, ideas. We have admired each other with good reason and we are determined to move forward also with good reason. So what's left for us to do? Everything. The world is here to be healed. The world is here to be aligned with, with its evolution, an evolving quantum universe in which all things are not connected to each other, all things are each other. There is no separateness in the sense that purely one thing is in and something and other things. We are it. We are together an evolving universe. Imagine how completely differently one would behave. One would act vis-a-vis -vis others, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis that blade of grass vis-a-vis -vis the nature, vis-a-vis -vis culture, vis-a-vis -vis other people, if you would realize that we are it, we are together, not separate beings, we are together an evolving universe, a quantum universe in which information is distributed to all equally. Listen to it, allow it to work. My ex own experiences, I'll end on this note, my own experience is that when I sit back, allow my thoughts to develop, then they write themselves, then they come out, then they come forward. If I try to force an idea, it doesn't work usually. I sometimes a message that I didn't like really appreciate afterwards, as it turns out, just it doesn't go through. I think technology helps me also is intuitive. I just, that's just a belief. But I feel that we are not alone. We are it. We are together, an evolving system. Behave like that. Then I think our future will be what it's meant to be. Bring consciousness into space and time. Bring a high level of consciousness. That way, this, this humanity, or, or rather this planet through humanity, will get to know each other itself and will get to contribute to the world around us. Our contribution is through becoming conscious and, and spreading the consciousness on higher and higher levels. That's the destiny of the universe. That's the human destiny to be aligned with it, to help with it. Despite the hiccups, despite the, 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 the problems, the traumas, we are moving in that direction. Let's move together. 
because we are more than separate people being together. We are people who are one. The world is one. We are one. Consciousness is one. We keep saying that. Let's remember it and let's act like it. Thank you for your attention.